I'm going to do a brief little bit about brain development, and then I'm going to talk about the consequences on brain development for children who are deaf and hard of hearing. So the brain is a complex system that self-organizes, moving towards greater and greater levels of complexity by becoming more and more integrated. That occurs from experiences with parents, primary caretakers, and interactions with the world. Experience changes the brain. Good experiences change it positively, and bad experiences change it negatively. If we create the right conditions, the brain will emerge and will be able to adapt, learn, and handle life as well as anybody. The brain develops from bottom up. So it develops from the spinal column up to the brain stem, which manages the physiology of the body. And then it moves to the right brain and develops the emotional system. Then it crosses over the midline, and it develops the left brain, which is um, language. And then it moves to the frontal lobe, which is all the executive functions, the higher brain functions. All of the later stages of development in the brain, moving up and over and forward, all of that is dependent on the earlier stages. So when you have a good foundation, the next layer does well, and the next area does well, and so on. When you have problems from early on, it affects all subsequent areas of development. And it requires us to really back up and work on repairing or uh, addressing the issues from the earlier levels of development in the brain. A couple of um, processes or dynamics that are directly involved with brain development. I want to go over briefly. Neuroplasticity, epigenetics, critical and sensitive periods, and pruning. So neuroplasticity is the process whereby experience changes the brain. It, it stimulates neur neural connections. The, the in integration process of the brain is not about growing new neurons because we're born with what we've got. It's about creating new connections, more and more connections over time. And those connections occur when the brain gets stimulated and then a new connection occurs. The more the connections, the more integrated the brain is. The better the brain functions. The less connections, the less integrated the brain is. And the less well the brain functions, the more chaos and rigidity we see from people. Epigenetics is the study of how environment affects gene expression. So when we're born, our brain is wired, designed, for certain genes to either turn off or turn on at particular times in development. But again, the brain's experience development is experience dependent. So the brain has to have particular kinds of experiences in order to activate the genes to either shut off the ones that are supposed to or to turn on the ones that are supposed to. And if it doesn't have those experiences, the genes won't be expressed. So the old thinking of nature versus nurture, it's really both. We're born with everything that we need, but then it's when we interact with our environment that determines how we blossom and how we grow, or how we don't. If we're regulated, if we're settled in our system, our genes will turn on or off as they're supposed to, and develop continu development continues as it should. If we're dysregulated, overwhelmed, anxious, our genes may not turn on or off on or off as they're supposed to, and it causes significant difficulties to subsequent areas of development. The brain has areas that either are, have to be stimulated at a critical period of time, language and vision are two of those, or really sensitive periods that if they're not, if they don't receive the kind of stimulation and experience that they need, then those periods, the window on those periods are closed, and subsequent development in those areas is going to be severely hampered and limited. 
Pruning is a process that the brain goes through where our brain is, is about survival and it's about maximizing efficiency. So early on in um, young adolescence, <clears throat> later childhood, early adolescence, the brain starts to get rid of or it prunes neurons that it determines are not needed, are unnecessary to the survival of the organism. The brain's number one job is survival. And so if the brain determines, well, all those language areas aren't getting stimulated, we obviously don't need them, they will eliminate or prune out all those neurons. And then it's extremely difficult later on to develop language. One definitely won't develop language to the same level of ability that someone does that doesn't have early language deprivation. deprivation. So pruning is a process that everyone's brain goes through. And so we really want to early on stimulate all the areas of the brain and provide all the experiences needed so that the brain sees, oh, I need that area. I need those neurons so that they're available for, for later functioning. Mm. To talk about brain development and deaf and hard of hearing children, there is no typical deaf child or typical hard of hearing child. And so I have a continuum uh, where I, I just roughly plotted out looking at deaf and hard of hearing children on a continuum. And on one end would be English proficiency and English competency and moving to more bilingual ASL in English and then moving to ASL proficient and then moving to um, kids that we see who has no, have no functional language or no established L1, no established functional first language. So when we're considering deaf and hard of hearing children and what they need and what they bring to us in terms of us as service providers or parents, we have to look at a whole bunch of different factors. We want to look at the degree of hearing loss, if there's residual hearing or not. We want to look at the age of onset of the loss of the hearing. Was it prelingual? So was it before they developed language or was it after they developed language? Are they auditory or visual learners? For children who grow up more dependent on their eyes, their brains really develop differently in that their visual areas are much stronger. They are much more dependent on taking information through their eyes than is a kid, a child that has more hearing or is completely hearing. <clears throat> Those children, their brains are much more dependent on auditory input. And so depending on what kind of brain that we're dealing with, it makes a real difference on how we approach it, how we evaluate, and how we develop programs for these kids. Another factor to consider is whether they have hearing parents or hearing siblings or deaf parents or deaf siblings, whether they have sign exposure if they need it in their environment. And, and uh, another one is if the child's lost their hearing before they develop language and we get them, they come into our program or our school or our facility, how old are they now? A three-year-old that's prelingual has much more ability, if we really intensely focus on language development, to catch up and to, ha and to develop a functional first language. If they're seven or 10 or 12 or 15 and they have no functional first language, then the consequences are gonna be much more severe and the programming is going to be completely different for that child than this child. The slide that you're looking at now is of a difference between a neuron that's been trained and one that has not been trained. And you can see in, in the slide the neuron on the left that's had really very limited exposure is, is like a, a dead tree. It has very few branches. The branches it has are really short versus the nurse neuron on the, white, on the right that has been trained is like a fully developed bush or tree. Loads of connections, loads of branches, just full and rich. And that makes a real difference in terms of what happens in the child's brain and in terms of their functioning and development.
This next slide shows a normal brain, quote, a nor normal brain with typical exposure and experiences. And next to it is a uh, brain scan of a child with severe neglect. And you can see that the child on the left, and this is for a three-year-old child, that the child on the left has a nice full-sized skull and brain, uh, not many darkened areas. They're dark where they should be, where there are true gaps um, or spaces in the, in the brain. And then on the right, it's a significantly more shrunken skull and brain, and many more dark areas. And the dark areas are where the neurons have not grown or developed, uh, where the connections have not been made. And, and the one on the right is from extreme neglect. And children who are deaf and hard of hearing, who are not exposed to language, who, who, who grow up with folks that love them but don't know how to serve them, don't know how to help them grow, they inadvertently have the same experiences and consequences as a child who has extreme neglect. Their brains look the same. So I want to talk more about, specifically about children with hearing loss and the consequences to them on brain development. So I want to talk specifically about children who are deaf and hard of hearing and the consequences on brain development. One of the first consequences, one of the earliest consequences, is that there's no, there is often, I want to say 100% of the time, but there is often no what's called contingent communication between the parent and the infant. Hearing parents are very used to tuning into their child's noises and sounds and cries and movement. And they're not as oriented to tuning in to a child that's more visual, that makes more expression less through sound than through facial expressions or movements. Contingent communication is the process where a parent is tuned into a child, they perceive what the child is communicating, they understand and interpret it accurately, and they respond to the child in a timely fashion. When they do that repeatedly, it helps, one, it helps stimulate the child's brain growth, it helps calm the child, and it, it helps the child feel securely attached, connected. When parents inadvertently, or providers, teachers, dorm parents, whatever, when adults who are interacting with kids who are deaf and hard of hearing, and they don't pick up on the communication cues what happens is the, the infant or child pretty quickly learns that nothing's going to come back. I'm going to, you know, go and, and I'm not going to get something back. I'm going to, you know, make some gesture and it's going to get missed. And if it's not reinforced, then I'm not going to do it again. And I pretty quickly learn to stop communicating, to stop trying. I, I, I don't consciously figure it out, but the, the infant child figures out that this isn't going to get rewarded. This isn't going to get responded to, so I don't keep doing it. We, we do what works. If it's responded to, the, the child or infant learns, oh, I do this, and I get this back from you. And I like that. I'm going to do more of that. If I do this and I don't get anything back, it sort of falls flat, and I do it again, I do it again, eventually I just stop doing it because it doesn't work. I find some other way to engage you or to get you to be involved with me or to respond to me. Sometimes it's not always positive what the infant or child figures out how to get you engaged. So one of the first, one of the early consequences is that the lack of contingent communication fails to stimulate the child to re-engage or to engage in the relationship on a continual basis, which affects their, their development. Another consequence is that it affects the attachment patterns. There are a number of different patterns of attachment. Children come out of the attachment period zero to four, either securely attached or insecurely attached. And it affects their attachment security. 
they don't feel as connected, they don't feel as safe or as cared for in relationships, which affect, directly affects their brain growth. But it also can develop a, an insecure attachment pattern where they can become anxious, where they're, they're not secure in relationships, they kind of cling, they're not sure whether caregiver is going to be there or give them what they need, or they become avoidantly attached, or they exhibit avoidant attachment behavior, where they essentially give up on relationships and, and figure out that I need to take care of myself, that I'm kind of in this alone. And they don't seek out relationships for comfort. Another negative consequence of deafness on brain development in terms of attachment is they develop negative beliefs about themselves. Children who develop insecure attachment patterns develop negative beliefs about themselves, about relationships in the world. They think they have no value, they're not lovable, they're not worthy, they're not worth being attended to or cared for, and they internalize that belief which then gets laid down in their neural network and it operates, it's a, it's a belief that then they go through life with until they change it. And, and when you have really negative beliefs about yourself, you operate in the world in ways that make, without meaning to, that make those beliefs come true. If I believe that I'm not worthy of love, I engage in relationships where th where they fall apart, bad things happen, and it verifies my belief. See? There you go. I'm not worthy. Or if I'm getting abused. See? I knew it. And none of this is conscious. All this operates on the unconscious level. But those beliefs drive us. And, and one component of therapy, of good therapy, is bringing unconscious beliefs to consciousness so people can change it and then engage the world in relationships differently. Another consequence of uh, insecure attachment patterns for deaf and hard of hearing children is either no sense of self or a very critical sense of self. Often have poor self-esteem and a really strong sense of shame. When we are neglected or inadvertently ignored or inadvertently not connected to, we internalize this sense of shame, like there's something fundamentally deeply broken and wrong about me, and it's toxic. And, and it makes people disengage and not want to participate in relationships because shame is such a horrible emotion for us to, to experience or to tolerate. We will keep it really secret. And we don't, don't want anyone to see that darker part of ourselves. So, so often children will come out of this period with a toxic sense of shame, which is really destructive as they go in life. And uh, another consequence in terms of attachment and brain development for deaf and hard of hearing children are problems with self-regulation abilities, where they're not able to regulate their system to calm themselves, to manage their attention, to manage their body, to be able to... Um, uh, stay steady, to, to calm down when they need to problem solve. And they're also not very easily settled or soothed by someone else. So it, it has dramatic impact on the regulation abilities uh, effects. There's also dramatic social isolation, which can cause anxiety and depression. And, and a lot of these children are on the periphery of their peer group, of, of society. And it just reinforces that sense that I don't belong, I'm not connected to anybody. Probably one of the most dramatic consequences for these children, which has dr the worst consequences to brain development, separate of any abuse, any abuse or trauma issues, but fundamentally are language issues. Either they don't develop a functional first language, or there are significant delays in the functional first language. And again, there's a critical period, and so there's not a lot of time to really get language into this developing brain, and language is critical. We le use language to make sense of our experiences, to process what we learned, 
We use language to calm ourselves, to talk to ourselves, to understand the world. And we, we don't have language. We're much more reactionary. We, we, can't, we, we can't understand, we can't recognize the patterns of life. We can't interpret what's happened. We can't encode experiences and to, to be able to use them later um, to navigate the world. So language issues, when, when we come across deaf and hear, hard of hearing children who have language issues, that in addition to emotional difficulties, that is a number one critical area to focus on. Deaf and hard of hearing children have either little or no access to incidental learning. And incidental learning is learning without a direct attempt. The brain looks for patterns in the world and it unconsciously figures out the flow of life. Deaf and hard of hearing children, they miss out on a great deal of information causing delays in knowledge and experience. And they develop what can be called splinter skills, that they may be good at this, sort of okay at this, no good at this, they don't know this at all, this they're good at, this they're not great at, this they miss, this they don't know. Whereas a, a typically developing child will, will develop consi more consistently across all these domains. Maybe, maybe a little stronger here, a little stronger there, but they're fairly consistently in their development. For deaf and hard of hearing children who miss out on incidental learning and or have language delays, they, they develop splinter skills. And, and that's really important when they come into school for us to be able to know what do they know, what do they not know, what are they able to do. And I'll talk more about school later on. Incidental learning for typically developing children, for hearing children or deaf children with deaf parents, they, they figure out the world just by participating. You know, no one sits them down and says, okay, we're going to the grocery store and this is what we do first. We get a cart. We take out our list, which we made at home, and then we're going to go down this aisle first, and then we're going to come back this aisle, and this aisle we're going to put all our things. We're not going to eat stuff yet, and then we're going to go to the cashier, and we're going to have to give them money, and then we get to take, they're going to bag it up, and then we put it in the car, we take it home, and we put it away. Typically developing children, they see it. They see it again and again and again. They understand that there's a pattern, that there's a process, there's a routine. Same thing when they go to the bank. Same thing with ordering pizza. Same thing with using the internet to order a pizza. Same thing with use of credit cards. All these life skills that the typically developing child is being exposed to and that they are picking up and they are figuring out as they go along. Deaf and hard of hearing children who don't have access to instant learning, they miss out on all of that. They often get um, uh, criticized as, or judged as not having common sense. But common sense is learned. Common sense requires experience. It remi requires you understand what's happening around you. And when you miss out on incidental learning, you miss major amounts of fundamental information about how the world operates and how you operate in it. So incidental learning, missing out on it, is a huge issue. Another consequence to deaf and hard of hearing children is learned helplessness. Learned helplessness, passivity, and developing an external locus of control. The learned helplessness, the passivity is when is because I don't know what to do, I don't do much. I wait to be told where to go, what to do next. I, I, because I don't understand what to do and or because I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake and that shame makes me not take too many risks. So one of the consequences is that they become very passive and they just sort of take what comes. And, there's a, and with that is this learned helplessness, this, this belief, this experience and this belief that develops that I'm powerless over the world. It, it, it's called, um, the, the opposite of that is to develop self-agency, a sense that I, I can affect the world. If I move into it, I can, I can make things happen. I can 
go to the bank and take out money if I have money. I can call a cab and get a cab. I can order at a restaurant and get food. Self-agency, the ability to move into the world and take action on it. Learned helplessness instills a sense that, like, there's just nothing I can do about it. And that also leads to an external locus of control. We have either an internal locus of control or an external locus of control. An internal locus of control says, I'm, I'm in control to a degree of myself and my world, and I can affect change in it. External locus of control is more of a victim view, uh, more of a sense that everything is out of my control. There's nothing I can do but sort of hold on and hope really bad things don't happen. And so the consequences of learned helplessness, passivity, and external locus of control are pretty significant impacts on the developing brain. Another significant consequence is that these children often are not school ready. They're, they're not ready to learn. And they present at school at the same age that typically developing children present. But they don't have the foundational language, knowledge, experience, or skills. And yet, they're expected to start and to go forward. And so there are significant consequences about not being school ready. And unfortunately, schools aren't really designed for not school-ready kids. So that's an issue we have to continue to address um, for these children. Another significant consequence is on executive function. So executive function skills are here in the frontal lobe, and they are all the higher level skills that we need. They are absolutely essential in school, and they're essential in life. And they are the last area to develop so again, because the brain develops from bottom up, if the earlier eight, uh, levels of development or stages of development in the brain are negatively affected or didn't go very well, they affect all the subsequent areas. And, and it's cumulative. This one, then this one is worse, and then this one's even worse than that, and then this one's worse than that. And then when we get to the last one, being executive function or higher cognitive skills, those are even more significantly affected. And the executive function skills include working memory, uh, the ability to monitor yourself, monitor your emotions, monitor how you affect other people, monitor your behavior, the ability to regulate, to manage your emotions, to manage your behavior, the ability to organize yourself, the ability to plan, and implement a plan and check on how that plan went. Um, for example, if I want to, um, if I have a school project where we're going to make a volcano, there's a whole lot involved in that. I have to think about what I want to achieve, what are the steps to getting there, what are the materials I need, how am I going to organize all that, how much time will I need to do it, how do I know how, if I'm progressing along the way and at the end it's going to look like a volcano? All of those are executive function skills. Working memory is critical, the ability to hold information in my mind to solve a problem. If I can't, if you tell me I have to achieve this task and I forget instantly what you said because I'm too nervous or because I don't have adequately developed executive function skills, I can't get anything done. Working memory is critical for school and success in life. So executive functions problems is another area that's impacted for deaf and hard of hearing children. Another area that's impacted, which is really under um, recognized and underserved, are sensory issues. So our sensory system is um, develops early on in the infant toddler and our sensory system filters out we're, we're receiving I think it's about a million bits of data per second or minute we're getting a lot of input into our sensory channels sight smell taste touch feel we're getting all of this our brain is bombarded with sensory data. 
Right now there's the lights, there's noise in the room, there's people sitting here, my hands are moving, all of this is bombarding my brain. And a well-integrated brain, a well-developed sensory system, will filter out all of that so that I can stay focused, so I can remember what I'm talking about, so I don't get overwhelmed. When children have inadequately developed sensory systems, or immature sensory systems also, then they get bombarded with all this data and they can't filter it out. And it causes the brain to just shut down or to blow up. They just get overwhelmed. And, and by definition, deaf and hard of hearing children have a sensory loss. It's a major hit to their sensory system. And unfortunately, the way we measure that today in, in schools, primarily, and in clinics, is we fill out a questionnaire and we total it up, and if they get the magic number, we determine they have a sensory issue. And if they don't get the magic number, we determine they don't, they don't qualify for OT or sensory integration services, then these kids continue to struggle because it, when you have an overwhelmed sensory system, it shuts your brain down. You can't learn, you can't function well. So sensory issues are huge and they're relatively easy to address. There are things that we can do day in, day out, throughout the morning, throughout the afternoon to help children's sensory systems settle, but also to wire them so they function better. Because of neuroplasticity of the brain, the brain changes with experience. There are very particular experiences we can give to these developing brains, these immature brains, these impacted brains, that will help them become more well integrated. And then they can filter out all of this sensory input without overwhelming them, without causing them to shut down. Another consequence is that they have a very narrow, what's called a window of tolerance. So the brain functions in an optimal zone. Our, our, our whole system as humans, we operate within a real narrow range of temperature, um, pressure, and, and if we're outside the optimal zone, our brain doesn't work well. The window of tolerance is how wide, how big that zone is before my brain gets overwhelmed and either shuts down or blows up. And the way the window of tolerance increases is that when you have parents who are doing attuned contingent communication with an infant or a child and helping that infant manage their emotions, the more the adult helps them handle what they're feeling, helps offload some of the energy and the emotion, helps soothe them at the appropriate times, helps them be able to tolerate sadness and fear and hurt and worry and scary things. The more the parent helps them manage that, the more the window of tolerance for that child increases bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now they grow up and they can handle this much before their brain gets overwhelmed and shuts down. For children who are neglected, who are deprived, who inadvertently have parents who aren't tuned in or caregivers who aren't tuned in, they get overwhelmed really quickly and there's no one to help them mediate that or manage all those emotions and all that energy. And what happens is their window of tolerance, they get overwhelmed really quick and no one helps them get a bigger and bigger window of tolerance. So they grow up with a really narrow window of tolerance, which means they can tolerate this much stress or stimuli or pressure before they just get overwhelmed and either blow up or shut down. So the window of tolerance is significantly impacted by hearing loss. So along with a narrow window of tolerance comes emotional immaturity, low frustration tolerance, and low emotional tolerance. And low frustration tolerance is really consequential, it causes a lot of problems. To learn anything new, we will get frustrated. Any new learner of any new skill 
it's a frustrating experience to learn something new. And, and parents who are tuned into an infant or a child help them regulate that emotion, that upset, that energy, so that that child can tolerate the frustration so they can learn to get up, they can learn to walk, they can learn to read. When you have low frustration tolerance, a low window of tolerance also, what happens is you try something new, you get frustrated, you get overwhelmed, you shut down, and you quit. And you don't try anymore because it's just too uncomfortable an experience. Our brain is about protecting us from bad things. And so if trying to learn is is a failed experience, it triggers my shame, it frustrates me, it makes me upset, I learn pretty quickly I'm not going to try and do that anymore. And so I give up on trying to learn new things. And so low frustration tolerance has really far-reaching consequences for the school-aged child and for adults. Another consequence or last consequence is um, or another consequence is emotional dysregulation. So a lot of these children can't calm their nervous systems and they act out. They get upset. They may have anxiety, depression, anger, rage, and they can't calm themselves because their brain hasn't been adequately wired. They don't have the language on board. They don't have the attachment relationships. And so they have significant emotional and often behavioral problems. And, and when, when those of us who work with children or are raising children, when we don't have a perspective of the brain, we misunderstand what we're seeing from these children. And we interpret them as being bad kids, as defiant. We have all these clinical terms, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder. And, and it implies that there's something wrong from in this child. And, and in fact, what it is is that their, their brain just can't regulate their emotions. One of the last consequences I want to talk about is that for those of us, for those of us who, who are parents, grandparents, teachers, interpreters, in educational settings, we care about these kids and we feel for these kids. And these kids struggle. And one of the things that that activates in caring parents and caring adults is they wind up doing, they become overly protective and they wind up doing way too much for these kids. They try and protect these kids from the overwhelming frustration of life. With a lot of children who don't have an established first language, I'll see parents, interpreters who are excellent mind readers. They just know what this child needs. This child maybe just needs to point or nod their head a bit and the adults on it. They know exactly what they need. And so they read their mind they provide for their needs as much as they can. But the conse a consequence to language development is language develops out of need. If I don't have to express myself with language and you read my mind and you provide for my needs as much as you can, I'm not going to develop language. So as adults, we have to be able to tolerate the frustration and help our children tolerate the frustration of struggling through with communication so that their brains pushed to want to develop language, to need to develop language, so that they can express themselves more. Of them needing to solve problems. You know, the cereal box is up high. What are you going to do? I could get it for you. And if every time I get it for you, you're never going to learn how to get up and get it. So one of the things that happens for a lot of these children is that adults do for them a lot. And that, without meaning to, sends a message that says, you're not capable, and I need to do this for you. The message the adult want, means to send, I'm sure, is, I love you, I care about you, I know you're struggling, 
I'm going to help you out. But without meaning to, we inadvertently send the message that says, I, I get it. This is way too difficult for you, so I'll do it for you. Don't worry about it. And so we have a lot of children who grow up, they don't know how to do anything. They don't know how to navigate the world. And also that overprotective nature for a lot of parents, adults, shields these children from experiences. It sh they shield them from falling and scuffing up their knees. They shield them from getting hurt. They shield them from disappointment. And, and that's the function of, that's how we learn. How we grow is we fall. And then we go, ooh, I didn't like that. I want to learn how to not do that again. But if I'm protecting you from everything, you don't learn. And then when it's time for you to leave the nest, which that is our responsibility and our goal, is to help these kids have the wings to fly and leave the nest, they're not ready. They're not capable. And they go out in the world and they flounder or they absolutely fall apart. And then they land in the adult system, which is definitely not suited to help them out. And at that point, we're into rehabilitation with extreme delays and serious consequences. So, so we as adults have to develop our, the ability to tolerate this uncomfortable emotion so that we can lovingly and strongly support our kids to becoming problem solvers, to have um, emotional tolerance, frustration tolerance, and, and to figure things out like the rest of us had to. The last thing I just want to say uh, about all of this is <clears throat> our society is predominated by the medical model. Um, uh, physicians, um, big pharmaceutical companies, it, it pre predominates our view in the society as opposed to a brain model. So a medical model sees things as pathology, that things are broken and damaged. We have a, 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 a book in my profession called the DSM. Now we're in the DSM-5, the fifth edition. And it has all the diagnoses that exist, that we're able to use in our profession. And from a medical model, those are all varying kinds of pathology. Something's broken. Something's damaged. And from the medical model, we try and fix things that are broken. And we give a pill, we do surgery, or we say, sorry, this is how it's going to be, and that's life. From a brain model, we see things really differently. We see brains as doing the best they can to adapt to their world, to adapt to their situation and not as pathology. That from a medical model, this child who's acting out, being destructive, shutting down, refusing, being aggressive, their oppositional defiant, or their conduct disorder, or their, the, the old standby all the time, the really good one we use is attention deficit disorder. And from a medical model, we're going to medicate that, or we're going to send them to treatment programs, or we're going to use punishment consequences. That we need to just break the, the behavior in the child. From a brain perspective, this is adaptive. When I feel threatened, my animal brain kicks into gear, and my fight or flight mode kicks in, and it takes over to protect me. So if I feel threatened, I'm going to act out. Not because I'm a mean or bad person, but because I'm afraid. And my primal instinct takes over. And I'm going to protect myself any way I can. I'm going to run away. I'm going to shut down. If my sensory system is immature, I'm going to get overwhelmed. And I'm going to shut down. Or I'm going to act out. If I don't feel securely attached and relationships feel threatening, I'm going to act out. This is the best way my brain knows how to take care of me. It's adaptive from a brain perspective. From a pathological medical model perspective, it's damage. Or it's something that's gone awry that we either need to fix or we need to treat somehow. From a brain perspective, this brain hasn't developed 
hasn't had the opportunity, this complex system hasn't had the right conditions to help it emerge to be able to be better integrated and then function in a more healthy way overall, to be able to manage life better. So it's really important to learn about the brain and to take on a brain view versus a medical model view. And even to recognize that we're coming from a medical model view. A lot of us don't even realize that's the view we're coming from. We throw these diagnoses around. I, I see deaf and hard of hearing kids and they come in and they have a list of 10, 15 diagnoses, eight different medications. But from a brain model, if we can work from an attachment perspective and help this child feel secure, if we can create the right conditions, their brain will emerge, new connections will occur, and we will get much more healthy, helpful, good functioning from this child than when we address it from this model. So we need to adopt a brain perspective.